llamó. Sí, él le escribió el ensayo y vamos a hablar de todo lo que él me va a preguntar. Yo debo tener respuesta, ¿no? Supongo, pero la cámara... No es... Claro, de mi trabajo yo sé. Esto me recuerda cuando yo estaba en la escuela. Yo me pongo a escribir y enseguida. Así era mi... Mi cuaderno, tanto lleno. Y tanto lleno de dibujitos y... Bueno, tengo letra... Sí, es mi letra. Después no la entiendo yo tampoco. ¿Eres zurdo? Sí, soy zurdo, pero no puedo escribir. Yo no podía ni leer mis notas. Porque ahora escribo en la tiza con canto. No sabía que era zurdo. Sí, es porque no puedo. Good evening. Thank you everyone for joining us here at the gallery and live uh, streaming on YouTube. This is really exciting as uh, we continue to develop our program into the World Wide Web. We keep learning about what it is to have a digital platform. So we apologize a little bit for the delay in getting everything started. Uh, but we hope that you enjoy this program, and we're very excited for this uh, event. Uh, welcome to Combinations and Contradictions, a conversation between Larry Jose Mensa and William Osorio. We're very honored to be representing William Osorio, uh, an artist that uh, we've been working here at LNS Gallery with since 2017, uh, and we're currently presenting his exhibition, Margins of Truth. Uh, his artistic exploration is surrounding an identity and the, the human condition and things that surround us and develop us that sometimes we don't even see and how it forms and it helps to have this moment of reflection of who we are. And I think in today's moment that we're all going through, uh, this is a very special exhibition, a very beautiful exhibition uh, that allows people to come in and contemplate uh, everything that we've gone through these last 18 months. Uh, and with that said, I'd like to make a brief introduction for, of our special guest, beginning with Larry Ose Mensa, who uses contemporary art as a vehicle to redefine how we see ourselves and the world around us. The Ghanaian American curator and cultural critic has organized exhibitions and programs at commercial and nonprofit spaces around the globe. Osi Mensa has actively documented cultural happenings featuring the most dynamic visual artists working today and was recently named to Artnet's 2020 Innovators List. Thank you, Larry, for joining us, please. And now to the guest of honor, William Osorio. William Osorio was born in Olguin in 1989 he began his artistic journey at a young age in grade school. He initiated his studies at the School of Fine Arts in his hometown of Olguin, later choosing to pursue his dreams by emigrating to the US. In the States, he embraced becoming a self-taught artist, leading to a key factor in the spontaneity of his work. While in the United States, the Osorio, or William Osorio has participated in over 20 art exhibitions and group shows. He completed a residency in 2020 through Ulite Arts and the Anderson Ranch Center and is currently an artist in residence at the Bakehouse Art Complex. Please welcome William Osorio. So our panelists will discuss for around 40 minutes the concepts, the ideas, the practice, uh, and then from there we'll open it up to a Q&A, uh, both from the audience here at the gallery and as well uh, on the internet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you to the gallery. Thank you guys for being here this evening. Thank you to William. Um, I'm excited uh, to listen. I mean, as much as we'll be in the conversation, I think I, I want to hear more about this exhibition now that it's come to fruition. Because uh, William and I met uh, in Aspen um, last February. He was part of a residency that Ulite Arts organized. And this is one of the paintings that came from the residency. This, for me, is where the conversation really started in earnest for us. Um, but 
I want to kind of set the stage before we really get into the show to give some people some background knowledge of who you are, because I'm not going to assume that everybody knows mm. who you are. Um, and so I just want to start with um, your journey from Cuba. You, you immigrated from Cuba to Boston, then to Miami. Um, can you talk a little bit about that journey for you, you know, not only as an artist, but as a person? And how does that journey, the memory of the, that journey and those experiences inform uh, your practice and the work that you make today? Sure. Um, thank you, Larry, for being here, and thank you, all of you, for making the time, and LNS Gallery for orchestrating this gathering. Um, I, I left Cuba in 2007. I was 18 years old, and I have, I have just finished my second year here in art school. Um, so I decided to make the decision of stopping my art education and moving to, to the States. You know, when, when I was introduced to the art, the art environment in Cuba, I realized that it wasn't going to be a place for me to pursue an intellectual honesty that I wanted to, I wanted to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, given all of the political situations that we all know. So I went to Boston, and when I, when I arrived in Boston, it was a very drastic change for me, coming mm -hmm. from an island in the Caribbean uh, an island is this sort of a space uh, similar to its own planet. Yeah. It's floating there in the middle of the ocean, and we have this notion that we are different to everybody else. And what I understood, that was my identity, that was something original to myself. When I came to this country, I realized that I was sharing those anthropological elements with millions of people. So I have arrived in Boston. In the, knowing any, any English was a difficult transition for me, but I found a way of making that into my advance. As, as a painter, as an artist, one of the most important abilities that you could develop is the ability of observing, mm -hmm. sitting there and looking how people behave. Mm -hmm. uh, half of the time of the process of a painting is you touching the painting and you looking at the painting, making the decision where you're gonna put the next uh, brush stroke. From mm -hmm. that, you have to know how to look. Mm -hmm. And so I put myself in a place of the viewer. Mm -hmm. uh, same way the viewer look at my paintings now, I, I, I look at people and I start to use my work, my painting to be introduced into artist community. So at that point now I use the painting as a language to speak about the things that I want to talk about. In that moment painting became the language to speak about who I was because I couldn't convey messages because I didn't speak the language. And so that transition of moving here, realizing that what I thought was my identity was something that could be changed, that you know it was uh, I was open to learn and to feed myself from the experience of this other people that came from different cultures. I found myself meeting people from everywhere. So it was a moment for me to open up and, and, and see how perhaps this journey of you know finding out who we are is more of a transition and you know a constant state of movement towards a place that I really don't want to get to. I, mm -hmm. I want to enjoy, make sure I enjoy that process. Mm -hmm. And as you but, mentioned but but in Opening yourself up to that fluidity, mm -hmm. I guess, around understanding your identity, did you feel like you had to code switch at all in terms of like, because Boston is not, there's, I don't know if there's a big Cuban community there. No, there is no, there is no, uh, the Hispanic community in Boston is very limited and, um, but I, I went into the artist community. Got it. And in this artist community, I found people from everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I found people that were interested in, you know, in getting to know where I was coming from and getting to know my work. And so it was a moment for me to use my work as a language to communicate what I wanted to say, who I was, who I was until that moment. And I've been using my work and my paintings, ever since to convey, you know, what I think, how I think, and who I pretend to become. Mm. And how much is that 
changed, I guess, because you were in Boston, what, seven years ago? Six years ago? I was in Boston for eight years. Uh, I moved here about six years ago. And so, because one thing that I realized as you get older, you, you know, when you're young, you have I, an idealized way of looking at the world, and then life happens, and then you have these experiences that help you grow and evolve. I guess from Boston to Miami, are the ideas and concerns that uh, shape the practice the same, or how has it evolved, or how has it changed for you? But I, now that I'm looking back, I, I see that my work at that point was, was influenced my, by the personal experience that I was living. Okay. Um, now my, my work is very colorful. It had, it, it, I was able to go back to the colors of my traditions and the light of Miami. Miami has an amazing light. Mm -hmm. You don't see this in other places. Mm -hmm. And the work that, the works that I was making in Boston, they, they were pertinent and related to the human condition, but speaking about different things, I was feeling, it was by myself. You know, it was a moment of, like sort of what we went through with the pandemic of reflecting, you know, I went from being a teenager with a million friends in Cuba and a big family to be in a country that I didn't know anybody, didn't speak the language and I was by myself. Mm -hmm. So painting was my shelter. Mm -hmm. And the paintings that I was creating in, in the shelter that I was creating with those paintings were paintings that will refer to those things. Colors were very dark, you know, a, a, a band of color. And, um, I was always interested in the idea of identity and you know and, and how we experience the life but experience and time gave me allow me to grow allow me to read allow me to open up to new things and to realize uh, what i thought i was at that point it was not even close to it was just the beginning of a journey mm. and in that journey you're primarily self-taught mm -hmm. as a professional artist. Um, was there any teacher or influence? Like we, we were talking about with this uh, beautiful installation here, like Frank Stella, you know, who were some of the influences that helped guide you on the journey and kept you on the path or, or even maybe challenged you? My, I remember when I was in Cuba, those three years that I went to school, um, my first encounter with art, because prior to that, my approach to painting and drawing was a, a ludic one. I, I, I had an ability, I had a skill, but I, I wasn't really uh, doing it in a serious way, without the intellectual part of the creative process. And I saw, so in the school, they had this old paintings uh, book, uh, art history book from Russia. So I remember perhaps maybe three names. Um, Ilya Repin was a one of the archetype of Russian painting, the equivalent to, in literature, to Dostoevsky or Leo Tolstoy. Um, Valentin Serov, who was a, an amazing portrait artist, and uh, Ivan Chiskin, who was a landscape artist. Actually, the first painting I made was a copy of an Ivan Chiskin painting. Mm. And what, fascinated, what was fascinating to me about these painters is the looseness their ability to capture not only the likeness of what the subject, but in a way that it was sort of like listening to a jazz musician. Mm. You know, it was like a, almost like an improvisation. So they knew where they had to put it. And there, is this, there was this mixture of roughness, like a boxer punching the canvas, but in a seemingly delicate way. Mm. So those words, the artists that I believe uh, mark my aesthetic approach to painting, I, you know, I still feel close to them when I paint like that. And then, being a self-taught artist, I have the advantage of having the whole art history of, as teacher. Yeah. So in my work, as you can see, I feed from many fountains. You know, we have a, an abundant and infinite fountain of uh, amazing artists. So I will drink for them. Mm -hmm. I will, we could say that I'm a figurative painter because you know, we have this sort of uh, mirror, uh, I, 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 the idea of the mirror when we face a painting, I'm pretty sure that if we were a geometric figure, yeah. we, we will say that.
But why is that important? Because I think what's interesting, particularly with this show, and that's why we talk about combinations and contradictions, your ability to incorporate those geometric gestures um, to articulate uh, the figure, but then we talked a lot about, you know, uh, magical realism, right? So being able to pull from these literary sources. Um, so why is it important for you to be able to pull from that and for the viewer to experience that when they see one of your pictures? My, my approach to this, I, I want to create a, a painting that is, may sound pretentious, but I want to create a painting that is the universe. Okay. Not a reflection of the universe, but the universe in itself. Okay. And the universe is composed by everything. So the human figure as a central element in my work, that is the lens that we recognize and that we are more susceptible to feel empathy with because that's what we are, that's what we see. But then we have all of these geometric element and abstract uh, areas in the canvas that they do have a meaning for me. You know, I incorporate them in the, cam in, in the work uh, with the idea, for example, in a painting like this that we have in the background, I want to use those frames as a metaphorical representation of all of this, uh, of the horizon of meaning that exists once we arrive into you know, this existence and the frames, the decisions and emotions that we experience. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's better now? Good. Um, what I was saying. Talking about the frame. So, yeah. I mean, that was just one thing that I found to be interesting with the paintings. I, um, do these geometric marks frame the subject in the picture. Um, the use of color, but then also the use of texture. Um, and one thing that you know is particularly interesting about your paintings is that you have to physically see it. I want to make them tangible for you to yeah. see. And like I said before, if they if they want to use them as a representation of things that have a meaning in society, mm -hmm. we could talk about values and you know what it means, what is good, what is evil. So these things are not tangible for us and they may get confusing. You know, it's, it, it may be a little hard for us to define where is the lines that divide one side from the other. Uh -huh. So our freedom, our free will tends to be dictated by those things that already exist and have a meaning in a society once we are thrown into a situation like what I did here in the, in the installation. But because they are not visible and because they have been there for such a long time, it is easy to confuse them as something that is natural. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to present them in my work with defined with frames, lines, bright colors, even texture for you to see. Mm -hmm. For the viewer to see how that frame, that historical context, that is what Michel Foucault will call the episteme, like what is true in that society, mm -hmm. how that dictates the way we move inside of that space. But it's also a way for me as, a, as an artist, uh, recognizing those limits enable us to perhaps to get closer to our freedom. You know, knowing our limitation is a way for us to, to know what is the limit and how we can play an infinite dam perhaps inside of that limited space. That's what I wanted to do inside of the installation, create this space that has make sure the viewer goes inside of the space, activate the space, and it's the idea, that paradoxical idea of bringing the infinite inside of the limited space, and the infinite is within us. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, with us, the capacity of loving, creating, you know, feeling empathy for the other, creating a family, making art, making poetry, and we do all of that in this temporary existence that we inhabit. So that is the limited space that we inhabit, and those are the infinite amount of things that we can do inside of the limited space. So this figure is framed by those elements, but it could exist and be interpreted in infinite manners by the viewer. 
So is that where partially where the title of the show comes from, Margins of Truth? Because we talked a lot about this uh, oscillation between what's true, what's not true, what's real, what's not real, particularly because most of these paintings were made uh, in 2020 during COVID, you know, during an election year. Um, even when I was doing the essay, I think that's when the Capitol got stormed and, I, and you begin to question like what's going on in this society. Yes, um, so when I, when I use the word truth for the title, what truth represented there is reality. Mm. And reality sometimes uh, seems like out of a science fiction book. And you know that reality that we experience, as you were saying before, is full of those crazy uh, instances that make us question, you know, what is true. Uh, but also life as a whole, you know, is full of beautiful moments. But you know, my work has an. I'm a, I'm very interested in the existential part of. I love existential uh, philosophy, and it's something that, from where I fit a lot. Uh, what is it about philosophy that? Well, you know the practice. You know, to see art as something that makes questions, but doesn't answer them. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the art that I like, the books that I like, the philosophy that I love, is that that makes me question the things that I thought already knew, and. You know, when you have this reality that we ex that we live, you know, full of pains and, and people dying and, you know, being the subject of suffering or being forced to be the witness of somebody else suffering, you have something like art. So art is a way to resignify that. Mm -hmm. Art is a way to create beauty out of the ugliness of life. As There is a quote by Nietzsche that says, we have art not to die of truth. And that is the truth that I'm talking about when I say margins of truth. Mm -hmm. If I'm able to, if truth had margins, it means that I'm being able to bound truth to a space. I'm drawing lines around that truth, which created a, a space surrounding that truth for me to be creative, okay. to me, to, for me to resignify my practice. And as an artist, same way I have this approach to identity as something that is constantly in the making, this is my word today. This is how I'm able to convey my idea. This is the language that I'm using today. But I hope that I'm able to transform into something else in the future, okay. to resignify and change my language. Those are the artists that I love, the ones that were able to work in a, with a aesthetic 60 years ago. And today, they are doing a completely different, uh, talking about the, the essential things of you know, life making the same profound question about the human condition, but signifying that aesthetic, mm. constantly moving. So we obviously have paintings behind us, and, and it'll be good to talk about some of them. I particularly want to start with this, this painting, because um, I look at it as a, a portrait within a portrait. So mm. it's, a, it's a portrait of your mother holding your green card. Yes. And, and we talked about the green card being kind of this you know, for some people, the symbolism of freedom and possibility, for other people, um, anxiety. And so I guess, can you talk to us a little bit more about how this painting came to be and, and the process and why uh, it was important for you to make this, this picture? Because this was um, during a trip you went to Cuba, when you went to go see it. Yes, um, so the painting is based on a photograph of my mother that I took uh, the first time I visited Cuba in 2010, and it was just right after I got my green card. It was my first time flying back to Cuba. And we were at home, and I look at my mother sitting in the rocking chair uh, with La Bata de Casa, looking at my, my green card. My mother is here today. And so I, I was able to, to perceive in her face this mixture of feeling for those who are immigrants and Cubans that are here, you, you will understand how it feels, you know, that moment to going back. And so I wanted to do a self portrait originally. So I decided to paint myself 
with a green card, just the green square, the green rectangle. That's how I wanted to present myself. I wanted my identity to be in the painting, but it wasn't about me. It was about what my mother was feeling. And afterwards, I, I spoke with her, and she, she had told me that you know, she had this mixed feeling situation where you realize that, OK, this represents the possibility of the family being reunited at some point. But it also means that officially you are not a Cuban resident anymore. You've been outside of this home for three years, but now, at this moment, you are not here officially. Mm -hmm. And it is a comment for me on the impossibility of relegating one's own identity to a simple bureaucratic document. Mm -hmm. So when you go back to Cuba, for, for me as a Cuban, I'm seen as a foreign now because I reside outside of Cuba, but you know I have lost my rights as a Cuban citizen, but they won't recognize my American citizenship, for example. So I'm in that sort of identitary limbo going back to my, the country where I grew up. So but how do you navigate that? Because we talked about, I'm first generation Ghanaian American, um, and I've spent like at least in the last six months, two months in Ghana. And like, you know, I'm recognized as a Ghanaian, but I'm, for most people, I'm American. And so I guess, how do you navigate that, that space where like now people look at you as American because you have this document, but obviously I'm sure you feel very Cuban. How do you, how do you navigate that personally? And then I guess, how do you think about injecting that kind of double consciousness in the work? Because we see that in a piece like this one, um, in this piece, where you have these two identities kind of mirroring and looking at each other and then almost kind of uh, 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 tussling with each other. Well, as you, know, as you may know, it is a very, it is a difficult but, a, but enriching experience mm -hmm. because you are, well, when I, when I came back to Miami, I came back to my, to my Cuban uh, environment again. When I was in Boston all those eight years, I didn't really have a relationship with the Cuban community. There was no Cuban community. And when you are away, I, you know, growing up in Cuba, th the thing with Cuba is that, mm, there has been many Cubans, many Cuba. The Cuba that somebody that came here 60 years ago remember yeah. is a different Cuba to the one that I, that I experienced. Sadly, the one that I experienced worse. Uh, but the times that I have been back home, now that my family is here, you know, the, the house that used to belong to the family is not in the family anymore. Mm -hmm. When I go back to that space, those walls, they don't convey the same meaning to me mm -hmm. because my grandfather is not there. You know, my little brother is not running in the house. My mother is not, it's not the same thing. Go back home, my childhood friends are not there anymore. So you have this space that you will expect will transmit some sort of profound feeling to me. You mentioned before that when we are young, we, idea we idealize things. Mm -hmm. And that happened to me the first couple of times that I went back to Cuba. I, I idealized the, the return home, like Ulysses going back to Itaca after the yeah. Trojan War. And, and you realize that you get there and Actually, the meaning of that transit is in the transit itself. Mm -hmm. You know, you get there, you, you find that it may be a disappointment. Mm. So I'm, I've been in this city for the last six years, and I feel like this is home now. Okay. Yeah. When I was in Boston, I it was different. This is, you know, this has the climate that I grew up with. This has I could speak my language here. Yeah. And everywhere, uh, I have come to my friends here, I have a life here. And so now I feel like a different type of Cuba. Okay. That we have come to me in this, in, in, in this space. But you, you know, you, you inhabit between those two worlds, as you said before, because I was brought up in Cuba, that's, it's part of my subconscious. It's, it sometimes, sometimes it takes the way I think. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what, what role, because we talked about dream space, right? And like, I think there's a part of Cuba that now exists in an imaginary, mm -hmm. and there's a memory. And can you talk about that in relationship to the, the paintings? Because I feel like a lot of times your subjects are suspended in space. 
you know, and they're undergirded by this frame that you build. And I think like this piece right here, uh, which features a, a mutual friend of ours, Edson, mm -hmm. but it's a reference of a uh, Caravaggio painting. So can you talk a little bit about the function of dream space and like the imaginary and how you uh, attempt to articulate that when you're making, making these, these, these pictures? Well, all of these paintings are based on photograph, but being based on photograph, they are based on events that didn't occur. Okay. I, my part of my process is to take many photos of a specific situation, and I will cut those photos and reassemble them and recreate what I remember happened, but it's not what it happens anymore. Because I'm using parts of, physical parts of separate photos to recreate the moment. And, and so do you think about that as a metaphor for like that trip to Cuba, for example? Yeah, Okay. of course. You, you know, you have, you have that idea of a thing, but you also have the possibility of resignifying that past from the present that you are living. Mm. And as an artist, I live an experience, I see something I like, I see an event that I would like to use for a painting, but I don't want to paint what is happening there because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at people and people are having a different experience than me. You know, the, we have a painting here in the show that is a family portrait that is about that. It's this idea of going to a gathering and everybody as an individual will take a different experience, a different memory back to where, wherever they came from of that experience. For example, the painting of uh, our friend Edson back, back here, it has two um, historical reference. One is, uh, it is a, an homage and a reference to Caravaggio uh, flagellation of Christ. That is the composition. It was taken from there. And it was taken from there because I was reading something which is the other uh, reference for the work. There is this book by Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges uh, the Universal History of Infamy. Mm -hmm. And in that book, he go through all of infamous moments of history. And right at the beginning, the book starts by saying, in 1517, the Spanish missionary Bartolomé de las Casas, uh, being witness of the suffering of the American native of the Caribbean island, uh, being languages and, and they were forced to work hard in the gold mines of the Antillians. He felt empathy for this group of people that he was, the suffering that he was exp being a witness to. And he recommended uh, Charles the Fifth, King of Spain, a project for importing Africans, Africans to take the place of the natives. Of the natives. So to this old philanthropic twist, we owe the next 500 years that became the flagellation of a whole continent. So that word right there, when I, when I read that, I, it hit me in a way because the intention was good. So this person was able to feel empathy for the pain of those that he was able to see, but didn't think of the consequences of this idea. Mm -hmm. He was able to see in his, during his life, lifetime what he has created, and he became advocate to try to, to stop it, but it wasn't, it, you know, he, he couldn't. It was, it, it was too late for him, and so I thought of, uh, when I thought of the idea of the flagellation, the constant state of, you know, of pain and suffering of somebody, and and why in particular, because you said you specifically wanted Exxon. I wanted Exxon because uh, the, what was it about the, this painting is a beautiful, uh, beautiful image of a white male body. And it's a white male body of Jesus used throughout history for the European continent to be able to empathize with the passion of a Christ that looked like them. Mm. So going back to the idea when Bartolomé Las Casas was able to empathize with the pain that he was being witness to. And so I wanted to use that, to use the beautiful body of a black man that, and put him in the position of Christ to represent the pain
that that idea cost in Exxon ancestors for the, la for the next half millennium. Mm -hmm. So we are still seeing the consequences today. And was any of that in response to what was happening in the country last year with like George Floyd, Black Lives Matter? Well, when you, you know, you are reading all of these things and, and of course you are making connection to, to your reality, to mm -hmm. what's going on. And um, perhaps, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's one of the reasons why it impacted the way it did. Because I have, I, I have read uh, this before. I'm, I have read all of Borges' book and when I, re I, I go, always go back to him. And every time I go back, I find something new. And yeah, you know, reading that and, and being aware of what was going on in the country at the moment, it became more alive mm -hmm. to speak about that in a moment like that. And then just thinking about COVID, how did you navigate the beginning of COVID? Like, what was your routine? Because I know you read a lot. Mm. You probably read more, but like, how did you navigate that? How did you maintain a sense of sanity? And then when did you decide, okay, I need to get back in the studio and start painting and start making work and start creating these mirrors for other people to consider and think about what's happening in the world around us? I, that's an amazing question. Uh, about the sanity, you will have to ask the people that live with me for them to answer if I was able to maintain my sanity. Uh, I, did, I, I read, uh, did a lot of reading. I did some small paintings during that time. And during the quarantine, the time that we were at home with our loved ones. Now, this was a, a special time because even people that have been with their partner for a long time, we never spent this much time together. You know, you normally you go to work and then you come back home, you spend the night together and then maybe a weekend, but a day and another day and a week and day after day and week after week wow. on months. This was a different experience for the most of us, I, I imagine. Um, so out of this situation came three paintings. Mm -hmm. Three paintings that I titled Paradise. Paradise, Paraiso, Uno, Dos, uh, One, Two, and Three. Um, and this one of uh, this is one. This is number one. So Paraiso one. I'm in, in that painting. The composition is uh, my girlfriend and I see laying the sofa. I was reading, and what I was reading is a book that. You know, it's a, I was reading the One Thousand One Nights, like the Arabian Nights. Okay. It's a book for child, but it's a book full of wisdom and, like also like Borges. Every time I go back to that book, you find something new. And I was laying in the sofa reading this book, and I realized, well, I started to, to think on the title, you know, this idea of the 1,000 and one night. And I saw how similar it was to the situation that we were living, mm -hmm. you know, like the days going and going and going, and that idea of the one after the title represented the possibility of infinity, because in the book, the person telling the story never f finished the story with the idea of staying alive for the next day. Actually, back in the day, the prison sentence would be like that. It would be 20 years and one day, and that day represented the possibility of infinity. This could keep going and moving and moving, and that was the, the, the exact experiences that we were having. You know, the, that time of seclusion was a week, two, three, and then you didn't know when it was going to stop, and I started to see how the that space that we inhabit, our home, became a little paradise. Mm. And when I started to think about the idea of paradise, you know, many came to mind. To mind and the first uh, reference that I had, that I assume that most people have as well when they think, think of a paradise, is the biblical reference of a paradise. Uh -huh. And so what it was, for me, was a, an endless garden, a space where you could inhabit free, um, secure, in a state of safety, what well, it happens to be that the etymological meaning of paradise in antiquity, a paradise was an enclosed garden. It was a limited space. Mm -hmm. It was a space where you will sort of take control over nature and direct nature the way you want it to go. It was a garden. A garden is a perfect combination between culture and, 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 and nature. Things, things grow the way you want it to go. And so and in this case, it looked more to the idea of paradise that I told before, like this, the home. 
a limited space in which you inhabit. You know, you build, for those who have a family and kids, they, they try to build it in a way according to their values and their morals. And it is it's supposed to be a space of safety. And if we go back to the etymological meaning of paradise with the wall, I also question myself, wow, well, if you needed a wall at the beginning of time, who were you living outside of those walls? Mm. During the pandemic, we were living the other outside of the walls of our home because that represented dangers, you know, even the possibility of death. And we were fighting an invisible uh, possibility of death. Mm -hmm. And in that case, fear, you know, fear is, uh, is wisdom in the face of dangers. You know, it's understandable that a person feels like that. But, you know, if you translate that and you move that to the political and social context of this country, how we tend to live what we understand as the other outside of our walls. Mm -hmm. You know, we try to build societies in which, you know, we erect walls and we live what we understand as different to us outside of those walls. So I, you know, I was working with that idea and the idea of safety and I spoke with my friends. These are friends of mine that they gently uh, decided that they, when I asked, they wanted to pose for the paintings. Uh, we have Isa and, um, the other painting is Andrea, another friend. And so I, I spoke to them that I wanted to do a painting where you will convey the idea of security. You know, you are in a space where you, you are secure and you know you can be there. And because the idea came from, from a book and because of literature enforced my work in the way it does, I wanted them to use a book that was an element of their identity. Something that they were reading, something that had to do with who they were and these are the books that you make reference to in the essay. Mm. But the most important book is the one that we don't see the cover. This is the one that I'm reading. It's the one that you will have to ask me uh, which one it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You might as well tell us. Yeah, so I w that's when, I, when I was reading the 1001 Night, that was the, I don't remember exactly the story that I was reading at that point, yeah. but that's th that was the, the, the genesis for all of the, uh, from where everything came. And then talking about safety, is that why, because I think in particular with these works, you see this kind of doubling of the figures? Mm -hmm. well, the, yeah, uh, one of the things that happened during that time is that we, we were forced to face our own fragility. You know, we saw ourselves for the same time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we saw our humanity uh, threatened by nature and it was a moment to reflect, hopefully, for most people. I, I think I did. Mm -hmm. And you know, how I'm, how I'm living life and what I want to do. And you know, we live uh, in a society that things move in such a speed that we normally don't take the time to think about those things. And I want to ask you, because I know there's some artists in the audience, uh, a nerd question. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about without going into every step, but the process of actually making a painting. So you're in the studio, you just got a canvas stretched, just so people can kind of understand the amount of labor that goes into constructing one of these paintings. Because I don't think people always get it that like, if you remove the figure, that's still a lot of labor to get to that point. So can you talk a little bit about the process kind of you know, the velocity kind of uh, ebbs and flows with the splats, um, with, the, with the geometric shapes, with the different washes that you use. Well, the, uh, the process starts now. I'm thinking now while I'm talking to you in a world that I'm making in the studio. Mm -hmm. So part of the process is not only facing the canvas and touching the canvas, but for me, I, when, when, I, when I go there, I, I position my, myself in front of the work to start physically working on it. I, I already have thought about it, so I want to, I, I conceive the work conceptually. Do you make sketches? I, no, I don't make sketches. Okay. I, I work direct on the canvas, okay. but I work from, the sketches that I make are those photos that I take. Okay. I take those photos and I construct a composition that I want to use. Okay. And the way I, Paint the figure is almost like it's a, if I was sketching because I work with a very dry brush. Like, 
I don't know how you say in English, trying to draw with the, like, direct with the, mm -hmm. uh, with the paint. Yeah. I do use pencil. Okay. I do use pencil because I also want, uh, so even my figures that they look, um, I'm, I don't consider myself a realistic painter, not even a figurative painter because a lot of these people, you know Exxon, yeah. but most people don't know how they look like. Yeah. So I don't have to be faithful to the likeness of the people. Mm -hmm. I just, so I don't have that responsibility. It's, for me, it's not about that. But I want to use, I use the pencil and I, 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 I want to leave it visible. You know, sometimes if you get close, you'll see the mark. You'll see the mark. And those accidents, I don't fix it because it, it's, it's part of that. For example, the painting for me start from the back. The last thing that's going to go there is the figure. I start working from the back, the way I work on the installation. Mm -hmm. So the last thing that will go into the composition will be the figure. Okay. Because I have to create a universe for the figure to exist. And as you said before, before I paint the figure, there is a painting already made. There is a painting already made. And I, I follow a process in which I have to, I work with acrylic and also with oil. So by the time I get to the oil part, because I combine the process, I go back and forth, there is a lot of time in between for a part to dry, for me to go back into the work. So I don't, I tend not to work in two paintings at the same time, but while I'm working on something, I'm waiting for that to be ready to get back to the painting, I'm already thinking and, and like using collage and taking photos for what I'm doing next. Okay. So I have one more question and then we'll open it up to the audience. We have this incredible installation here. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about one, why was it important to activate this space and create an opportunity for the viewer to be in one of your paintings? Mm -hmm. And two, I guess what was if not the most challenging part of constructing this installation, what did you learn from this, creating this? Well, what did you think about? The first the thing I learned when I was working on it is how influenced influence my work it is by Frank Stella. Okay. <laughs> I didn't realize until that point when I saw the forms created like, in a 3D manner. So my idea here was to recreate the experience of a painting. Mm -hmm. So everything you see in there is uh, are the elements that compose one of my work. Everything except the human figure. So the space gets activated once you go inside of the space. And I already mentioned what the frame means. So you go in there, you walk around the frames, you inhabit this limited space that I have created for you. I like to think of this as the sixth day of creation according to the Bible. Everything is made except the human being. Yeah. So now the human being is ready to go there and experience this uh, new universe that has been created for you. It is a universe in which you could move, but your freedom is dictated by the obstacles that I have created for you to experience. And there is an element in, in this work that the forms are only finished in one side. Okay. So given that they mean the values and the truths of uh, a specific context, when those truths are only made up to the half, you as a citizen of that society have the ability to keep working on it. Mm. So I'm offering the experience to the viewer to go inside of a work and not only see the part that is finished, but to go behind the scene and see how it's made and see how it's made, and that is a reference of how we can change you know, the society we live in. Mm. It's very different to when you experience a, a painting. A painting is already made, and it's hanging in the wall, and it's presented the way I wanted you to see it. But here you are able to go behind and see you know, the material that I use and, 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 and be part of, of, of the work. Mm. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So I want to open it up to any questions. We have a question with this gentleman and this young lady. Are there mics that are going there, or do we have to give them the mic? Yeah. Mm. Well, the mic's coming. One second. Um, thank you. Great conversation. I love your use of color and the colors that you choose. And my question is. Do you, is it, how do you choose the colors? Is it intuitive and random or do you have a process? Yeah. 
Thank you for the question. I, I use them because these are the colors that I have in my palette, and these are the colors that I love, but they are there for a reason. I, I mentioned before that my work is to have a more discreet palette, not so bright, and this is when I was living in a different city that had a different light, but because these frames and this element, for me, they represent all of those things that I mentioned before, the values and the truths and the horizon of meaning of a particular historical context that are a little hard to perceive in real life. I want to paint them as bright and notable, not noticeable as possible for the viewer to see, for the viewer to realize how framed we come to be by this element. So it is impossible of looking at the painting without, as Larry mentioned before, it, they are as important part of the composition as it is the figure. So that is the reason why the colors are there and why they are that intense. Thank you. Federico? Right. <laughs> Thank you both, um, firstly, for sharing such a a wonderfully uh, interesting conversation, so very nuanced, and it's, it's obviously given us a lot to think about here about this, these amazing works. Um, William, you, you, you've mentioned this, you invite us as participants to experience the, the human condition through your lens, and you've invited us into the three-dimensional version of the entire experience where we begin uh, before introducing ourselves with an expectation into the process we're then a part of the process in the installation, and we come out the other side, having participated um, with our own unique experiences. Uh, there's a transformation there, however limited or however profound. What has your experience through this process uh, given life to in, in, in the form of a transformation for you as an artist? What, what do you walk away reflecting on, thinking, there was me before this, and here we are now. Um, and, and what does that uh, invite you to, to look for going forward? Thank you, Federico, for the question. <laughs> um, well, Transformation, that is what I attempt my work to, to be about. Uh, I, I had the possibility of experience, experience working in, the, in a 3D manner for this, and it was probably the most challenging part of the uh, exhibition, created the installation that was created here for the space. I, thought about it, we, we spoke about it, but until that point I only had a few sketches of what I wanted to do. And I worked with Frederick and you know he he guided me throughout the way. Um, and I I rediscovered say rediscovered because that very brief uh, time in my art school in Cuba, I I wasn't a sculptor. And it was a way for me to to re encounter with that medium that I have in uh, I haven't practiced, I have that muscle that I haven't exercised in years. And thinking of the possibility of perhaps including, uh, keep working on it, including elements like that in my paintings, maybe, or even taking, uh, we, we, we spoke about even the possibility of activating this space with performance to take my practice outside of the studio. I would like to work on that. I would like to, to meditate on, on that idea. Uh, and even perhaps uh, public uh, work with elements like this that I've already been thinking about things. But yeah, it's been a process of transformation. Every time I came in here, it was like, uh, how do you say in English? Taking a shower in the rain. Bañándose un aguacero. Because you, know, you, you will be baptized with new ideas. And as I mentioned before, it was my first time seeing all the work together like this. And when you see them like this, and when you work with a curator as good as Sergio is, they, they, you know, we position the paintings in the way they are, you start to look at them in a different way. And you, you start, they, they, 
they open doors for you to perhaps move in different direction. And that's what I want. You know, I want my world to, to keep, uh, I want my world to contradict what I believe I already know. Mm. And this is what I know for now. I'm just hoping to be contradicted. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Osorio, Mazeltov. Mm, thank you. It's been more than a year that I go to a museum, that I see an exhibition in person. Um, I have been looking at that painting since I first came into the gallery. And I didn't know why. Uh, you know, amongst the other ones, because everything is and goes to the personal. That Sillon Cubano, mm -hmm. um, it's iconic to all of us. I mean, I left as a kid in the 60s, but um, when they sent me to Europe alone, to Spain alone, as an unaccompanied minor, I uh, wrote my mother a letter. I had no money, I was a kid. And my father took a picture of her reading my letter and send it to Madrid. So it's a very emotional painting and it reminded me, it reminds me of Alice Neal. Mm -hmm. She was, uh, uh, okay, <laughs> thought it was my phone. Um, Carlos Enriquez was married to her. Mm -hmm. And um, I admire her work incredibly because it absorbs all my attention. I listen to her portraits. So I'm doing that since I s even saw that painting. I thought of Aunt Alice Neal. And then I realized this is why this is so familiar to me because this is what I think unites everybody that moves out of their country, which is the commonality of the experience. And um, you're an incredible artist. So, felicidades. Gracias. Oh, there's a question here in the front. We'll take one more question. This thing, this thing lady. Yeah, online. online, okay. Well, um, first of all, congratulations. Uh, I had the opportunity to speak with you the last time and I was really impressed. We talk about Paraiso and it really kept on my mind. <laughs> um, well, as I was seeing there, the composition has, for me, a classical basis because it has a, um, symmetric distribution of the elements, you know, verticality or in those, okay? And that, uh, as um, contrasted with the dynamism and application with the technique of the color, and also the, the movement that we see with the, what I call vertices and triangles, you know? And this is perfect harmony, right? And um, I was wondering if this is, has something, to, what connects me is that, uh, this is basically what we feel. We have our values, we feel this balance, this equilibrium, and it's contrasted with the daily life that we have to solve so many issues and so many problems. Mm. So that was really connected to the paintings, and um, I was wondering if I, uh, I was the only one, <laughs> or if you felt the same way. Thank you. More problem solving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, I remember that we spoke at the opening and it is nice and beautiful to hear you speak about technical stuff. And those elements uh, appear in the composition in an intentional way. In this painting, it's visible how one of the members, the el el brazo, the arm that is moving, it goes with the yellow frame that is behind. And I try to create that uh, 
that balance, as you call it. I see, for me, the act of painting as a jazz musician will play. You know, you, we have this idea of improvisation, but you can only improvise on the top of those notes that you already have. And for a jazz musician that knows the craft and that knows the music, so he'll know when he has to stop and how far he has to go not to be outside of that. And so for me, I, a lot of those elements and, and things that you mentioned, they are intentional in the painting and sometimes I surprise myself finding out after or during the process. And it is a good thing to think about how conditioned I come to be as an artist, as a painter, that I've been doing this for the last 15 years. Uh, sometimes I don't think about it, but it's happening. I'm pretty sure a lot of the artists that are here are able to relate to that, to to that activity. Yes, and thank you. Was nice. Thank you. So we have questions online. And also, please make sure if you don't have one, get a copy of this beautiful catalog of the exhibition. Uh, I have an essay in here that uh, was challenging to write because I wanted to get it correct for William. I didn't want to be casual about it because I think this is an important exhibition. It's incredible work. So please take a copy of the catalog. There's some in the front desk. Um, and William will be signing some if you want them to sign. Yeah. To sign and it's beautifully written. <laughs> I was, yeah. Well done, Larry, well done. So William, our dear friend, Laura Blanco, who is joining us on YouTube Live uh, from New York City, has a good question for you. She says, you spoke of transformation. What about assimilation? Has it played a role in your life? What was estimulation? Assimilation, yeah. Well, um, the way I see it, uh, stimulation somehow is the engine and the motor for transformation. You have to be willing to get there to be able to move towards there. Uh, I believe that we are uh, beings of desire. Uh, like I mentioned before, Larry, when you talked to me about, asked me about the process of painting, I, I have a working mind right now that I'm going to start, I'm already working on, and I'm thinking about that. I'm dying to go back to the studio to paint. And my attempt is to transform that empty and blank canvas into something that I have, I have here, mm -hmm. that I've been thinking about. And yes, I think they go hand by hand, uh, the stimulation and transformation. Uh, you need to be willing to, to do something to, to make the step and, and move forward. Thank you, question? Laura, for the question. We have another question? No? Okay. okay. So we don't know who this person is, but she goes under the alias of China Linda. And China Linda would like to know that you typically use, or she sees that you, or you said that you use people that you know in your body of work. Is that something that you gravitate towards because you feel comfortable using people that you know? Or is it an experience that you're searching for because they're people that you know? Uh, I use people that I know, and every time I want to speak about something, I make sure I tell them what I want to say. Uh, I don't want to use them in something that they don't agree with. Uh, some of the times when I have painted my family or my mother in the painting before, it's about that experience, and it's about my mother. It's about that moment in my life. But in some of the paintings, uh, these are the people that I have close to me, and they become a mean for me to speak about something. So they are transformed into language uh, that I use to write my stories. Mm. So they are in the paintings because these are the people that are, they are close to me. And in a way, it's a, uh, these are people that are close, that they have helped me with my career. It's a way for me to give an homage to them, uh, in a way, also. Uh, but yes, I believe I have answered the question. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Hi, William. Un <laughs> gustazo. Um, I guess my question, and it's very simple, and maybe I might have missed it because I did walk in a little bit late, but it goes that around all the paintings, there's this common theme that there's these little plants on the bottom of every painting. And I guess, just of curiosity, why is it that you do that? Like, why do you have those little matica everywhere across all the paintings? Good observation. Yeah. Uh, nice to meet. Nice to meet you, Ed. <laughs> um, yeah, the little maticas, as you call them, they are a reminder for us that you know we live. So we are beings that live within nature. You know, we are not separated from nature. Doesn't matter how much we wanted to divorce ourselves from that animality and natural stage, the stage that we inhabit. It is a way for me to remind my viewers and remind myself that that is the same environment that we are sometimes exploiting. You know, we have it right there. It could be pretty, we could use it, but we have to remember that we have the obligation being uh, the inhabit of this universe that have the ability to think, to take care of that. Because, you know, now we know what we're doing. And then we have one more online. So this question is from, I don't know this alias name very well. So I'm not really gonna say it because it doesn't seem correct. But anyways, uh, they're asking, who do you think is the greatest philosopher of all time? Ah, and, one? and that person should change their alias philosopher? name. Yeah. Good question. You're, you're the philosophy buff. Yeah. I could give you uh, some of my favorite, but you know who am I to judge a philosopher? Um, I really top, love. Top three. Yeah, I love Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche. I love, even though I don't understand he completely, Martin, Martin Heidegger. Mm. And I believe, uh, from my point of view, that one of the greatest writers that whose work moved between fiction and philosophy is Jorge Luis Borges. He's not a philosopher technically, but I have been able to know of this philosopher through his work. When I started reading Borges, I didn't understand anything I was reading. And all of the reference he, was, he would do to Schopenhauer or Nietzsche or all of these people, I had to go and find that book and make sure I read that to be able to understand him. So he's not a philosopher, but he was the introduction to philosophy for me. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. With that, thank you, William. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to the audience who's watching online. Thank you to LNS Gallery, the team here, the production team. Um, this has been an incredible experience to be in dialogue with William, to experience this exhibition. The exhibition is up until May. May 22nd. May 22nd. So if you are in Miami, come see the show. For the audience who's here, come see it again, spend time. Um, these paintings have so much to reveal to us and it's a joy uh, to spend time, you know, continuing to learn and see what it can teach us. So thank you and have a great evening. Thank you guys. Thank you, man. Thank you. That was good. Painless. <laughs>